Welcome to the second lecture in the biophysics class. I'm going to start today too with a historical background showing you some very old movies uh, and then we're going to jump into a number of physical concepts that I've divided concept by concept which hopefully will make it easier both for when you're studying and when you're looking back later based on the study questions. Let's start it with movies. This is an old, very old movie generated by Cyrus Leventhal. Uh, that was actually displayed on a computer screen, then filmed with 16mm camera, and then many, many decades later, this was 66, uh, Mike Levitt and a few other friends uh, transferred this back to computer, and I got these from my friend Mike. This was the first ever computer representations of protein molecules. To you, it's obvious that we can look at structures this way. You've probably seen this a ton of times. But in the 1960s, it was a miracle that instead of looking in columns of X, Y, and Z chord, Cartesian coordinates for every single atom, you could visualize and try to understand conceptually what a molecule would look like. Myoglobin here was one of the first protein structures ever determined. This is from the LMB in Cambridge, and it's a, it's a protein that binds oxygen in your muscle tissue. And it has the, the part that binds oxygen is an iron-containing heme group. We'll get back to that later in the class. I'm going to show you a second example, also by Cyrus. This is the protein lysozyme. Um, that's an enzyme that breaks down bacterial walls, um, and it's present in tears, saliva, mucus, etc. And here too, you can see properties of the structure. You're gonna, later on in the class, I'm gonna tell you that what these helices and beta sheets are. But here too, seeing this, being able to rotate it live and everything was a breakthrough that you couldn't imagine when you were used to just either standing in the lab or considering protein structures as a set of Cartesian coordinates. The person generating this, I just figured that it's fun to see when most of these famous people, when you look at them, you see very senior photos where they're very serious and everything. But the thing here, when Cyrus did this, he was fairly young. He was also a Mac user. Uh, well, not that type of Mac. Uh, here is the type of Mac Cyrus was using. Um, it's a computer screen and mouse. But note that you don't really have a keyboard. Actually, you do have a keyboard. It's the typewriter, but the typewriter is not directly connected to the screen. So you would type, get punch cards or something, let the computer run your program, and then you would have this circular screen that you would look at and film it. There is no way you could have text, direct text output. Uh, you might even see a mouse there in the background. And this is what the mouse looked like. Uh, of course, they didn't call it mouse. It was just some sort of Wait a lot. Mac stood for multi-axis computer. I'm not really sure what the multi aspect was. And then for fun, I'll throw in a picture of Cyrus sitting and typing at one of these teleprompters. You're going to hear more about Cyrus and something called Leventhal's paradox later on in the class, but I'll cover that when we get there. The next part is that we're going to be looking at specific elements of protein structure. So when it comes to structure, what we're going to need to decide is what are the atoms in the structure, but just looking at individual atoms is fairly pointless. So we're going to need to consider how and why atoms interact, how strongly they interact, and why some atoms prefer to interact with other atoms. You've probably taken this in various forms, either in upper secondary school or at university, but I'm going to introduce this in a slightly different way, possibly. This is more chemical than physical way. At the end of the day, the reason why any atoms interact is due to electrons. And electrons is, in principle, complicated. You should solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but if you're a chemist, then we need to be able to have an understanding. We tend to use something called orbitals, which is a schematic way to display the way electrons would interact with each other so that we can hand wave about how bonds work. But make no mistake, this is an approximation. And if you haven't heard of orbitals before, you definitely heard of it indirectly in upper secondary school. We talked about electrons in shells. So you might remember you had this first S shell and then three P electrons and then D electrons. And this is largely the same concept. It has to do with various energy levels. In each of these shells, you can have two electrons. And the reason we have two of them is that electrons are paired. And this you might also remember that you talk about some sort of spin up property and some sort of spin down property. Of course, that has nothing to do with up and down, but you can think of this of a sine equation, right? A sine is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. But if you now take the sine equation and push it 180 degrees, pi, 
you're now going to have another equation, uh, sorry, another sine wave that's also sometimes positive and negative, but it's offset. So when one is positive, the other one is negative. And this is roughly the same concept. Um, the electron maintains its charge. It has to do with density and where the density probability is highest. But that also means for these, for the s orbital, that's easy. That's rotationally spherically symmetric. But for these other orbitals, there is a very clear spatial favorability here. The uh, p orbitals are, think of that as Cartesian axis, x, y, z. They are orthogonal. And for the d orbitals, it's even more complicated. So why do I tell this? Well, it turns out that this concept of orbitals is going to tell us when atoms are likely to bind, um, what happens if uh, two atoms get closer to each other, when will they repel each other versus when will they bind, and it's also going to explain lots of concepts such as hydrogen bonding. What would happen if you had two of these with spin up? So if I erase that spin down for a second and then I put it as spin up. Well, what then would happen is that you would have two electrons that have exactly the same quantum mechanical ground state as they approach each other. And that leads to something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And you can even prove that's not that hard mathematically, that that would lead to an exponentially strong repulsion. So it's going to be very, very bad in terms of energy as they get close. So I'll erase that one so I don't have something bad written on screen. In practice, it gets slightly more complicated because sometimes if you're a chemist, you can have double bonds and things like that. I, I'll worry about that when we get there. We might not get there that much in this class. Uh, so can we use this to understand binding? Let's try. This is something very simple. It's two hydrogen atoms, I think. And each hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. And it's not well at very high temperatures in a plasma or something they would be happy that way but hydrogen is a fairly reactive molecule so under natural conditions what's going to happen is that you have these two hydrogens and as they approach each other what will what will happen is that if both of these electrons start instead of going if you have one hydrogen atom there and then one hydrogen atom there if this electron and that electron instead of being separated in the two hydrogen atoms being unpaired. What can happen is that we have our hydrogens and then we bring them really close. Well, that might be a little bit too close. Uh, but basically you would have both these electrons encompass both of the hydrogens. What will then happen is that around the left hydrogen atom here you're effectively going to have both spin up and spin down. And around the right atom, you're also going to have both spin up and spin down because they will pair up that way. So what's now going to happen, instead of having two incomplete atoms, you're going to have two atoms that each feel that they're complete. And this is going to lead to a chemical bond. What complicates things now is that this gets difficult to explain to a teenager or something. And then we start inventing all these things. We have covalent bonds, we have ionic bonds. This is what I would call an ionic bond. Oh, sorry, covalent bond. My bad. But in reality in life, this is a sliding scale. It's not going to be one fixed distance when it stops being one bond and it cuts over into being another type of bond. But I'm going to go through a couple of different ways these electrons interact at different distances and see if we can learn a little bit more about that. And I'm not going to go that much deep into the orbitals for now. We'll come back to the orbitals once we start entering the hydrogen bonds. So at close distance then, atoms would form covalent bonds because by pairing up, both electrons would feel like they had a complete first shell with spin up and spin down. If you now take these atoms and pull them further apart, that's not quite going to work that way. But on the other hand, we know that lots of atoms, even such as noble gases that already have two electrons in their uh, S shell, well, that have completely paired shells, they also tend to interact. Um, that's if you lower the temperature far enough, even helium will eventually become liquid, although that's when it's really cold. So one way or another, these atoms have to interact. If they don't interact, they would prefer to be in gas phase. And what happens with those atoms is that if we draw a nucleus here too, this is an atom, and then we have some sort of completely full electron shell around it. Well, that atom is happy. It doesn't really need anything. Uh, so you have lots of plus charges here. I'll just put four pluses. It's just a symbol. Uh, 
And then we have lots of minus charges out here. Minus, 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 minus. That would be a very special shell, but again, just an illustration. The net charge of that system is plus minus zero. No question about it. But what if I take another small molecule here, such as the ones that you looked at the other day, water. And at its intermediate distance here, I have my water oxygen, and then I have two hydrogens. You all remember now that we have these partial charges in this molecule, because the oxygen stole the electrons from the hydrogens a bit. And we can draw that, rather than drawing plus and minus signs, you could think of that as having a dipole here, right? So we can have a fairly, sorry, wrong direction, a fairly large dipole in the direction from minus to plus. But this, and again, this molecule too is neutral, but it's not neutral in the sense, it's neutral in the sense that it doesn't have a net charge, but it, the charges are not equally distributed inside the molecule, and that's what gives it its dipole. Now, if these molecules start to sense each other, what's going to happen is that effectively we have a bit of minus charge here on the oxygen, while the plus charges on the hydrogens are further away. We have minus charges here too, and plus charges. Uh, but what we can then do is that as these molecules get closer, what if we change the representation here on the left a little bit, so that we still have this nucleus with plus, 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 plus. But then we shift this electron cloud a little bit away. I'm exaggerating horribly here. What this will now mean is that the negative charges here have moved further away from the water, and this water, again, if I just draw the entire water as a blob here, as minus there and plus there, those minus signs are now going to like that it's plus signs closer here, while the well, we avoid the repulsion and increase the interaction a little bit between them. And another way of doing that, if both of these pens are arrows, you can say that you have one dipole here and you have one dipole here, and they have now lined up a bit. So this is going to create a weak attraction. Um, the net charge here is zero, the net charge there is zero, but they will still attract each other a little bit because the dipole here is inducing an effect in this molecule. But the question wasn't whether a noble gas would interact with water, right? We know that noble gases per se start to interact. Well, what if we had two of these molecules? Let's just think of it. Um, and if you were at absolute zero, nothing would move, right? And then we would likely have this as the best possible state you could imagine. But at finite temperature, atoms oscillate, uh, even electrons oscillate. Um, they oscillate much quicker. That starts happening at like one Kelvin. So at some point in time, if instead of having a water here, I imagine having another similar molecule. Here I have my plus charges. And here I have my minus charges. But now it's at high temperature, so at some point this molecule is shaking a little bit. The electrons is going in one way, completely natural, as the surface in a glass of water will shake a little bit if I'm carrying it around. But this molecule now has the properties like the water had up here, right? This is effectively a dipole. It's a temporary dipole. It will disappear in a second, but right for now it is a dipole. This second atom will respond to that, because here we now have a net dipole. This one is still plus minus zero, it doesn't have a dipole. But if this molecule now does the same type of shift of the negative charges in that direction, you will effectively, under very short time, have these dipoles line up again. And again, dipoles lining up. So what we had up here was what we would call add an induced dipole. And this, in that case, is an induced dipole, dipole interaction. 
This will happen for any atom, even if it's a noble gas, because they have electrons and even if they're not charged. It's going to be very weak because what, what will happen a nanosecond later, much, if actually much less than that, femtoseconds probably, these electrons will have shifted back. And then a little point in time later they might have shifted in the opposite direction. And then this molecule will have to adapt. And what that's going to lead to is that you essentially have an interplay, right, where these molecules start shifting around, but on average at finite temperature, they tend to be aligned. You can calculate the shape of that, um, and it's a dispersion interaction, and it will go as 1 over r to the power of 6. So it will decay very quickly at large distances, and it's also a very weak interaction, which is the reason that noble gases do not really attract each other by a whole lot. So these are essentially the two extremes. We have hydrogen bonds, very strong electrostatic interactions, and on the other hand, an explanation why things will interact at very, very long distances. There are more interactions, but before we go into all the other interactions, I will start to think about the complication that just happened here. Because this was not supposed to be a class on quantum chemistry, right? But everything we do here is about electrons and quantum. So on the one hand, it's great that we can understand interactions because they're due to electronic interactions. The problem with electrons is that we cannot treat electrons classically. There is no way we can treat electrons with simple ball and stick models. So does that mean that we should give up on this class and head over to the quantum mechanics class instead? Well, yes, in many ways we should, right? Um, because if it is about electron interactions, we I just spent a few slides or boards here justifying that we need quantum chemistry. So duh, of course we need quantum chemistry. You could even argue that I started introducing you to quantum chemistry even if we didn't use equations for it. But on the other hand, we have all these simplified models that I've showed you that are literally ball and stick models where we think of an atom as a ball and bonds as sticks. And people keep using them all over the world. So why do that? does that work? Well, you could argue that either that you're a realist or you don't know what you're doing. Um, there are many reasons why people have done this historically. Today we can treat maybe 100 atoms really accurately with quantum chemistry. When I was a student it was probably six or so. But that is not that an excuse. It's not an acceptable excuse because it's, if it's expensive or difficult to do it right, doesn't that mean that it's going to work to do it wrong. So I think we'll have to strike out that argument. The other problem though is that what I have here on the other side that's not really accurate either because what you do in quantum chemistry is that you put things in a computer and then you calculate what is the best possible distribution of electrons. Well first the best possible one we are working with time in this class so that you would have to solve the time dependent relativistic Schrodinger equation. And you can probably do that for like one electron. The other problem is that if you determine the best distribution, you're essentially determining what is the structure at zero Kelvin. And I hate to break it to you, but there's not a whole lot of interesting biology happening at zero Kelvin. The other problem when you do this, take any small molecule in life science, that's not going to work. We need water. I spent a large part of last lecture talking about the virtues and importance of water. You can't start doing life science, but say that you're going to approximate everything being at zero Kelvin and no water. That is just as stupid as the first item here saying that you're going to do a bad method because the usual method doesn't work. So it turns out that quantum chemistry on the one hand has a very accurate representation of some things, the energy between the atoms that are included, but it has a lousy representation of other things. It doesn't represent motion, it doesn't represent the solvent, and it can be surprisingly difficult for it to get very large systems to work, and the time dependence isn't there. The classical models on the other end have other strengths. Um, they are simple so that they're very fast to calculate. That means that we can reach realistic sized systems, we can reach systems that are involve water, and we can simulate those systems at realistic room temperatures when things actually move so that we reproduce what happens for instance if two atoms, uh, not two atoms, but two molecules get close to each other or if a protein is folding. And that's going to be a huge difference that we're going to come back to in this class. So doing things with simple methods looks great, as I'm showing you here in this movie. Uh, but the point is, this simplification has to come from somewhere. Uh, I can't just invent things out of thin air. So why does this work? Well, it works because we're cheating. And the cool thing is that in real life, you're occasionally allowed to cheat. So remember the water molecule. Um, 
we don't really have that many things to tune in water. If we make this simple, you could argue that we have the charge on the oxygen. And no matter what charge I put on the oxygen, I'm going to need to put half that charge of the opposite sign on the hydrogen. So that's really just one number I can tune, how the charge is distributed between the oxygens and the hydrogens. To first approximation, I'll say that the angle and the bonds here, that I'll take those from quantum chemistry, so I'm not really going to change those. The other part is that we're going to need some sort of parameter describing the repulsion between this. Um, that is, if two atoms get close to each other, how much are they repelling each other? In principle, that is two parameters, one for the oxygens and one for the hydrogens. But you will have to trust me when I say this. If you were to draw a water molecule a real way based on the radius of the atom, it would look completely bonkers. And that's why we don't do it, because it would look roughly this way. This would be the oxygen, and this would be one hydrogen, and this would be the other hydrogen. So you can probably come up with a reasonably easy approximation here. And if we just erase those hydrogens from the Lennard Jones interactions, the van der Waals, I'll get back to those in a second. So that it's pretty much just one sphere with one radius, that's one parameter, and we combine that with the distribution of charge, that is two parameters. I can in principle set these two parameters to anything I want. So what should I set it based on? Well, I look at water. And there are two very simple things with water. I know what the density of water should be. And I know roughly how expensive it should be to, say, boil water, the heat of vaporization. And I can just change these parameters to make sure that they fit the experimental properties of water. It's a horrible way of cheating. And of course, the reason this works is that quantum chemistry would get the same results, but from fundamental first principles. Here I'm skipping over all that and just tuning it to fit the experiment. But if that works, then I'm able to reproduce the diffusion coefficient of water, as I'm doing in this movie, it works great. And I'm able to do this orders of magnitude cheaper than I could do with quantum chemistry. So it's a pretty cool approximation. Who came up with that approximation? Well. There were a number of scientists involved in this. Um, there's a long, long, long story in this field, and unfortunately I won't have time to take you through all of it. But it started out in Schneer Lifson's lab in Israel, and coming very much from polymer physics. Um, oh, sorry, I might even have said that. And the situation in polymer physics is that people started using something called semi-empiric parameterization. That sounds difficult. It's not really. The first principal ones, that would be the quantum chemistry. The fully empiric parameters, that would be if I just tune everything to fit experiments. And I didn't do that here, right? I took the bond lengths from quantum chemistry. I took the angles from quantum chemistry. At some point, you're going to see that we take charges from quantum chemistry. So I kind of use a little bit of quantum chemistry, and then I combine that with parameterizing it to fit experiments. And that's why we call it semi-empiric methods. These methods have become immensely popular the last few decades. The first people to come up with this was uh, actually, well, it was Schneer, Lifson, and Ari Warschel in particular. And based on these methods, Ari and a few other colleagues uh, were able to determine very detailed models of large molecules, enzymes, where they use quantum chemistry for a small part in the middle, and then these semi-empiric models outside of it. And for that work, they were rewarded with the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2013. Almost any high-impact paper you read in biology today, if it's a new structure or something, they frequently include a bit of simulation, which is kind of fascinating, because only 20 years ago this was something very esoteric in theoretical physics. We're not going to start doing simulations quite yet, but we will have to look into a little bit about the interactions and how we model interactions in proteins, because that's going to be super useful when we start revisiting protein structure next week. So in principle, there are many ways atoms interact in molecules, but we're going to look primarily at large molecules, proteins, and we're going to try to group this the way we normally do it in our programs. It's not necessarily the only way of doing it, but I would argue it's the most common way. The first and simplest interaction, if we look at a almost, I was about to say mess, but this is a core of a protein. It's a beautiful structure. But let's look at just one interaction in the middle here. If these two atoms are moving rel relative to each other, that's going to correspond to a stretching or compression of that bond. And that's actually quite expensive to do because remember those electron orbital pairing I told you. If we're stretching that, we're going to move the electrons away from its equilibrium state. But that will definitely happen a bit at room temperature. There are many ways we can model this, and if we're going to do it with quantum chemistry, it becomes really complicated. 
So with quantum chemistry, this would be a so-called quantum chemical oscillator. And I'm not sure if all of you have studied quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics, but in quantum mechanics, what that would mean is that you would have a ground state that actually corresponds to a fixed length. And if you increase the energy, you're going to start to have some of the molecules populate a higher state with also a fixed length that's slightly higher, and then etc. increasingly higher energies. But each length is discrete, and that's what we see in these horizontal bars. That would be very complicated to do for us, so we're not going to do it. But uh, maybe we can cheat instead. So if you look at that blue curve, uh, that blue curve is, again, a very simple approximation. It's called a Morse bond potential. And what that describes is roughly at, at very small distances, atoms will repel each other exponentially. That's the Pauli exclusion principle that I already introduced you to and you might know since before. If you start stretching atoms, you're also going to have bad things happening, right? That um, you're taking something away from its equilibrium condition. But if you do stretch things far enough, at some point the bond will break. And bonds can break. And when bonds break, the atoms will eventually be happy. They won't be quite as happy as when they were together. But you can certainly, say, heat a gas until the point where the two hydrogen atoms and the H2 molecules go away from each other and form a plasma. So the blue potential does describe that. But then we think a little bit more about that. Wait a second. If we're going to study proteins around room temperature, how frequently is it going to be that we start having things... Well, we're never going to have plasma phase. That would be hundred thousands of kelvins. But how frequent is it that we actually break molecules inside the normal proteins in our cells? Well, it does happen once in a blue moon for very specific chemical reactions, but typically when a molecule is stable in an equilibrium state, it's neither going to form nor break bonds. And I would argue that accounts for 99% of what we do. And if that's 99%, we should optimize for that. So I'm going to take the approximation and make an even worse approximation. So I said, let's just assume that it's a, not a quantum harmonic oscillator, but a classical harmonic oscillator. So it is just a second order potential here, that the potential, the energy, is simply some sort of force constant multiplied by the square of the deviation from the average, from the equilibrium bond length. Is that bad? Well, in a way it is bad, but physics has been bad in that way for centuries. You might know that under another name, Hooke's law. Hooke's law has to do with this, the force when you're extending a spring, right? I hate to break it to you, that's wrong too. If you don't know that, it's kind of fun because I think every three-year-old kid knows that. If you have one of these springs that you're using to walk down a stair or something, if you're a three-year-old, you can't help but trying to see what happens if you tear it apart, right? And at some point you've distorted it so much that it won't go back. That has to do with memory effects and metals and everything. So Hooke's law, Hooke's law is not true. The reason why we use laws like that in physics is that you can imagine having absolutely any type of function, a potential describing a system. We're going to talk more about potentials in the next lecture, but this far we can just say, if I have a potential energy here that is some sort of arbitrary shape, there is something around the x-axis here. We don't know what it is for now. Uh, this might be the deviation from a equilibrium or the length of a spring, whatever. The y-axis here is an energy, and in physics and life, low energy is good. That corresponds to weight being on the floor rather than on the table. So this would be the best possible state here. Now, describing this entire equation is difficult, but what if I'm only interested in the deviations around the part here? Well, I could start by saying the first approximation here would be the actual value of the function here. But it turns out that's not very important uh, because when it comes to energies, I can talk about how far I've lifted a weight from the floor, but is this my floor or a floor in another building? So I can just say that the first approximation that is, I'll just adjust my y axis here to say that this is zero. The second part I would need to account for if I do a serious expansion here, that would be the derivative. But here's the cool thing. What is the first derivative around a local minimum or maximum for that matter? Well, it's zero. It disappears. So I don't have to think of the first derivative. And the next higher part I then need to consider is going to be the second derivative. So if I now take the second derivative and fit that around this local minimum, 
that's what I get exactly a potential like this one. And that's why they're so common in physics. So physicists apply this not because it's right, but if I don't know anything around a local minimum, I can always describe some things with this type of function. How good it is, that depends on how far we go away. But for bonds in our case, it's going to turn out to be an excellent approximation. There is only one approximation that's even better. We're going to come back to that when we do actual simulations. Remember that quantum mechanical oscillator? It turns out that if we stick to room temperature, 99% of the bonds would be in the ground state. So an even simpler way of fixing this would be to give all the bond lengths a fixed distance and say that they should not deviate from that distance. Slightly harder to implement on a computer, but much easier to understand in terms of physics. So as I told you about bonds, bonds are strong. We're talking about hundreds of kilo calories per mole. Um, unfortunately, that's something we're going to need to come back to repeatedly in this class. How do we count energies? Well, we're going to occasionally going to use kilojoules. We're occasionally going to use kilocalories. But it turns out that inside one molecule, these small energies would be absurdly small. They would be 10 to the power of minus 25 or something. And something tells me that you don't want to use numbers that small because it gets obnoxious. So instead, we tend to measure energies in terms of kilojoules per mole. That is, instead of measuring the energy in one bond, I measure the energy that would be stored in Avogadro's numbers bonds. And the reason why we've adapted that is that that leads to very nice numbers. You can talk about the energy of a bond might be 200 kilocalories per mole or something. 200 is an easy number to work with and I can't forget about all those exponentials. And that is so common that sadly, us chemists, we occasionally, we might occasionally be a bit sloppy and say that the energy is 200 kcal. And when I say 200 kcal, you should just take it for granted that I actually mean 200 kcal per mole. There is no way we would have absolute energy that would be 200 kcal inside a molecule. So why do we use kilojoules and kcals? There is an SI standard for this, and that would be the kilojoule. Uh, the problem is that standards are great, so people tend to develop their own. And if you look at this all over the world, in particular in the US, people still tend to use kcals, uh, even in parts of Asia. In Europe, kilojoules are more common, uh, but the sad part, both of these number systems are around. And that means you need to be aware of both of them. Um, there are very few, I don't think there is anything in this class that's going to depend on the exact 4.184 conversion factor between them. But you need to account for this factor of 4. For instance, if I ask you about the energy of a hydrogen bond, if you make a factor of 4 error, that's probably large enough that you might not get that right on the exam. So, in summary, uh, I would suggest that you look up these numbers. You're going to need to think about kilojoules. kilojoules per mole, kcals, and kcals per mole. So try to look up either for bonds if you want to uh, or the other interactions I'm going to talk about and get the rough idea what are the orders of magnitudes of the various energies you have and see if you can get a gut feeling about which ones of these are high and which ones are low. I will tell you a little bit about it in some of these short video recordings about the different types of interactions. After bonds, the second type of interaction we're going to discuss is angles. So I'm using the same type of molecule here, but instead of looking at just a relative displacement and the distance between two atoms, we're looking at how the angle between three atoms is varying. So if you have atoms i, j, and k here, we can draw one vector i to j and another vector j to k, and then we're looking at how this angle is varying. This is also a fairly strong effect, uh, just like the bonds, but it's softer than the bonds. And by softer, I literally mean that where a bond would not typically change more than one or a few percent under room temperature, an angle can change, well, not 10 percent, but a few degrees, definitely. Uh, so if a molecule has to be squeezed in or adapt when we're trying to bind something to it, the angles definitely can vary. So we need a reasonable model for the angles. So. Now that you're a skilled physicist and biophysicist, what type of model would you pick for the bond angles? This is a function. It's a function that will obviously depend on this angle, and you have, to tell the truth, absolutely no idea what it is. It's a completely random function that with some sort of complicated shape. 
and around this we have some sort of minimum and we would like to model that leads to the vibrations of a few degrees around this minimum. And since you already listened to the bond slide, I hope that you all agree that a reasonably good way of doing that is that we might have a potential that has some sort of force constant multiplied by a difference, say, in the angle squared. We might use a cosine function or something there too, it's not crucial, but it's the first order approximation of how the energy is varying around a local minimum. It works great for angles and now we can describe both bonds and angles. So we started with an interaction involving two atoms, then we had an interaction involving three atoms. You can probably guess what's coming next, an interaction involving four atoms. So we pick these same four central atoms. What if we look at some sort of relative motion that includes all four of them? This is getting a bit trickier to visualize. I'm going to try it anyway. Um, I can use my pens here. So here's one bond, here's the second bond, and here's the third bond. So the atoms would be at the end of the pointers here. So if you look at this, I can turn this around. So I'm not changing any angle here. The angle around this one, do you see? The angle there is fixed. And if I instead do the same motion here, but if I follow it there, do you see that the angle between that, that, and that atom, that doesn't really change either. So what is changing here, if you're looking along the middle bond, what is changing is a rotation along the middle bond. There are many names we use for this, actually no not many, but there are two. We occasionally call this a torsion angle and we occasionally call it a dihedral angle, and sorry, they are used interchangeably in the field. The way we define this is by each triplet of atoms here, I, J, K, for the first three atoms, and then the last three atoms that would be J, K, and L. Each such triplet defines a plane. And then we can take the blue plane here and the red plane, and there is then an angle between those two planes, right? That angle is the torsion angle. What gets a bit complicated here now is that we're going to need to find a way to describe this. And this gets complicated in two ways. First, if you look at the red and blue planes here, there are two ways to describe this. Do you pick the, in this case, the small angle or the large angle between them? Because that's going to be basically, one angle phi here is going to be 180 minus the other angle. So it matters which one you're choosing. The great thing is that we're scientists, so that we like to have a standard to define things. And in this case, we have chosen to define two standards. There is a convention that you sometimes call the polymer convention, and there is a convention that you call the biochemistry convention. If I tell you what those conventions are, you're going to skim through that. So I'm not going to tell you. That's a homework task now for lecture two. Go out in Wikipedia, look at torsion angles, and check what is the biochemistry convention. Biochemistry. And what is the polymer convention? You will typically not have to worry because we're normally going to stick to biochemistry, but if you start defining and calculating these angles yourself, you're going to need to know which one you're picking. Because if you pick the wrong one, things will be pretty garbled. And now you think you might think that you know exactly how you're going to treat this interaction, right? This is a sort of complex interaction that we would like to describe around local equilibrium and we don't know exactly how they work. And I think you're going to get this wrong because you would pick the simplest potential is proportional to a force constant multiplied by the square of the displacement of the angle, right? First, second order approximation. The problem with that is if I take this torsion angle here, if I start out here, and then I wrote this, this an entire turn, 360 degrees, 2 pi. Well, the deviation is now 2 pi, but I'm back in exactly the same state as I started. And in particular for small molecules, small molecules these barriers are low enough that small molecules can occasionally rotate an entire turn here. So for torsions, it's not going to work to simply have this very simple second order harmonic description of it. So we're going to need something else. We're going to need a potential that is periodic. And I bet you know about periodic potentials. So let's move on to the next slide and see what they look like. Periodic potentials. Here is a small animation of a molecule that is very much periodic. This small 
aliphatic hydrocarbon will keep going round and round and round. It's a butane. Um, and that can actually happen. There will certainly be an energy barrier roughly there. When the two molecules are superimposed right on top of each other, it's going to be better when it's stretched out, but it can occur in both those states. You actually have two more torsions here because carbon atom one and two here, if, those rot if that bond rotates, that's going to correspond to the three hydrogens rotating, and that's an even lower barrier. And of course, here too, the exact form of this potential can be complicated if we calculate it from quantum chemistry. But if you want something that is periodic on the unit circle, I hope that you would all say trigonometric functions, right? And that's what we're going to use. So the simplest possible trigonometric function would essentially be a sine or cosine in this case. Um, I like to have the lowest energy value to be zero rather than having to worry about both positive and negative values. So we're just adding a constant here to lift it up so that the baseline here is zero. Depending on this rotation then, I will going to have an energy here that starts out at a high value, then it goes to a low value, and then it becomes high again, and then it's low again and high again. This is an even simpler molecule. Um, it's actually an ethane. So you just have one bond you're rotating and then we have three hydrogen atoms here and three hydrogen atoms here. The reason why that is important, once you rotate it a third of a turn here, you're back in a state that's exactly identical to your starting state. I'm not sure if you can see the x, y axis here, maybe not, but as I already hinted, the reason why this is important is that the energy levels involved here are much, much, much lower than distortions in bond or torsions. So here we might be talking about a handful of uh, kilojoules or kcals. And that's low enough that it's going to happen normally at room temperature, which is of course also the reason that we need a potential that will realize that we're back in an equivalent periodic state. But I started with butane, so I'm going to need to show you what this would look like in butane. So if I remove that one and move to a slightly more realistic potential, there are different names, um, trans, cis, and gosh, that I might not have time to go through here. But if you look at that butane molecule again, by far the best state here is the one we have straight in the middle here. And that would be when the four hydrogen atoms are placed like that, oh, sorry, four carbon atoms are placed like that, the lowest energy. By far, the worst state we're going to have is if they are placed like that. And that's going to correspond to the peak here around zero degrees. And that is a hint if you're going to look up biochemistry versus polymer conventions. Now, these two other states correspond to things where things are not quite as bad as the cis state. So things have rotated roughly a third of a turn away from that one. So that means that things are not directly superimposed, but there is a not quite clashes. So it's not quite as good as the fully extended states. Those are called gauche. Um, the history behind that is not important. But you see that you have two local minima here. The local minima are definitely better than the peaks, but they're not as good as the best possible minima. Between these two called gauche states and the fully trans state, you have additional barriers. Those barriers are not good, they're high, but they're not as high as the barrier in the cis state. And now things are starting to get pretty complicated for something as simple as butane, that I have a very good low state and I have a pretty good low state, I have a very bad barrier and I have a somewhat bad barrier. The way we represent this is pretty much by using two periodic fun uh, two, uh, two cosine functions, but they have slightly different periods. One that corresponds to a period with 360 degrees and one that corresponds to a third of that. You're going to need to have a rough idea roughly what these energies are. It's going to turn out that this is super important for proteins and the torsional degrees of freedoms are the ones that are going to describe the entire shape of the chain. Because once you start rotating around the bond, if you have a long chain of connected molecules, well, in butane not much happens. But if you had 500 other atoms bound at the end of that chain, when you rotate this, that would mean that the entire rest of the molecule would rotate with it. So when we're rotating around bonds in a long chain, that tends to change the global conformation of the entire molecule. And now I'm almost getting ahead of myself and talking about protein folding because this is going to be important, but that's for later. So we're not going to look at an entire protein. At least I want to introduce you to the concept of what the torsion bonds mean and why they are important. So we want to pick something that is as simple as possible, but still has kind of some properties that are protein-like. And scientists have 
a toy molecule that we've used for years to study something. One of the simplest possible amino acids is alanine. We're going to look more in that next week. And if you want to take something that is just a tad more complicated than that, let's pick two alanines. Actually, this is not even two alanines. Uh, so I pick one alanine amino acid in the middle here, and then I'm just essentially picking the parts without the side chains. So this is a molecule that has, in principle, four bonds along this long chain here that we could rotate around. But I'm going to argue that we do not have four bonds. Do you remember that I spoke about the amino acids yesterday, or last lecture, that we had the C-alpha, and then we had the nitrogen, and then we had a carbon, oxygen here, then we had a second nitrogen, and then we had a second C-alpha here, and then we had a second carbon there. You also had those R groups, and then I'm not drawing any hydrogens at all to save a little bit of time. This part was this peptide bond that I spoke about in lecture one, how it formed. And by two amino acids merging together. And I already mentioned that this is going to be a very stiff bond with a resonance all the way from of electrons, all the way from the oxygen to the carbon to the nitrogen to the hydrogen there. So there's going to be a net shift that all the electrons have moved down a bit here towards the oxygen. And that's effectively going to give this central bond a property as if it was a completely rigid bond. This bond will never rotate. If we look up here on the right, it turns out that two of those bonds involved in these molecules, that's going to correspond exactly of this carbon that is not the alpha carbon to nitrogen. So we can kind of scratch those out. Let's forget about both those thetas for now. That means that we just have those other two bonds that we call phi and psi. They are by far the most important bonds rotations in amino acids and you're going to need to remember them and you're going to need to know which one they are. Um, they're called the, the torsional angles or the the uh, Ramachandran angles. I'll get back to uh, Ramachandran angles in a second. And we would somehow like to describe how this molecule is changing as we're moving those. So if I start rotating around those two bonds, the very first and the very last part of the molecule here is going to rotate and under some conditions the atoms might be clashing a bit so it's bad contact and in other combinations of these two bonds we're likely going to have very good contacts. So essentially I have a, this is an equation that I'm going to measure a potential energy that is a function of two variables and these variables would be the angle phi and the angle psi. For now we're not going to worry about the bonds and the torsions and everything, I will just assume that those will take the best possible positions. And you could of course draw that in MATLAB or something um, and a very simple representation would just be a two-dimensional diagram here. Uh, and in this case blue means good low energy and red means bad high energy. So it turns out that you have at least two areas here that are quite good where the molecule is likely to spend time and at least one area because this diagram is periodic so if you go out on the top you're going to re-enter on the bottom here. Remember the angles are periodic. The red area here is going to be a bad part where things are clashing and you do not want to spend time there. And it turns out that this was calculated from a simple molecular simulation, but if we now take this blue area up here, one local minimum and the other local minimum on the other corner there, we know what the phi and the psi angle is at the center of each of those minima. And then we can take those conformations and draw them. And those are actually the names that we say here in white. So we have in the case even of something as simple as the alanine dipeptide. It's a single amino acid, it just happened to have two of these two of the uh, peptide bonds so that we have both a phi and a psi angle. Even something as simple as that ends up having two local minima where the structure is fairly happy. And you're going to need to trust me for now when I say that you would actually see both of these as room temperature. Which is a bit strange because one of them will have lower energy than the other. So why do we see both? We'll talk more about that next week. So I've gone through most interactions now. Um, we covered bonds. We covered angles, we covered torsions, and we also covered these Ramachandran diagrams. That was the two-dimensional landscape that showed roughly how the energy would vary as the phi and psi angle change. And that's also why we call those Ramachandran torsions occasionally. I already talked, when I spoke about interactions, I already mentioned another types of interaction, right? Electrostatics and these so-called van der Waals interactions. 
and that's pretty much the rest. So if we take a molecule and just dive in, uh, no matter where we are in space, you can have a ton of atoms either in the protein or in the water or around the protein. Basically, we would never ever have vacuum at room temperature under normal conditions in a test tube. There is always an atom right next to you interacting with something. And that gets complicated because they're not necessarily, a water molecule is not bound to another water molecule or the protein. So we're going to need some sort of way of describing this. Uh, there are two parts to this. I already covered them a little bit. Um, one of them has to do with steric interactions that atoms cannot overlap. Pauli exclusion principle. The other part that is related to that, actually it's not really the same process, that's these induced dipole-dipole interactions I spoke about. The reason why we say that they are related is that if we for a second pretend that all these atoms didn't have charge, even if they don't have charge, they would still interact so that they can't overlap. So you would still have the repulsion. And even if they don't have charge, such as noble gases, they would still have these dipole-dipole interactions at very long distances. So there is one repulsive component when they get very close, and there is one attractive component at very large distances. The second type of non-bonded interaction has to do with electrostatics, and that you know since your undergraduate studies or even upper secondary school. A positively charged atom, ion, will attract a negatively charged ion. So in one way, the electrostatics is very simple. The problem with this, if we're now going to start modeling this, is that every single, if I pick one atom here in the middle, that atom might have two or three bonds. Uh, it might have three, four angles, and it might have five torsions, I don't know. But if you pick the atom in the middle, how many atoms, other atoms is it interacting with in terms of electrostatics and non-bonded interactions? Hundreds, maybe even thousands. So it gets computationally very complicated and expensive to handle this, which is a bit difficult. Let's have a look at how these interactions look like and how strong they are relative to each other. So I spoke about non-modern interactions in terms of electrostatics and van der Waals interactions. You already heard in a previous slide that the van der Waals interactions are quite weak. Remember, noble gases, they don't condense until very low temperature. So can't we just ignore those? Well, if I draw lots of atoms here, here's one atom, another one, third, fourth, fifth, etc. I'll let you imagine the remaining 5,000 ones. This one might have a plus sign, minus sign, plus, plus, minus, minus. If you now imagine having 500 atoms here, sure, these interactions are strong. But most things, if I look around me in this room, there are pretty much, there are no free charges. Even inside a battery, the positive and negative charges are paired up as ions in the electrolytes. So on average, if I look at a few nanometers around an atom, on average there's pretty much exactly the same amount of positive and negative charge. So while each individual interaction here is very strong, they tend to cancel each other. The problem is that they don't cancel each other exactly. So they might be hundreds of kcals per interaction, but plus to minus, that's attractive, minus sign in potential, plus to plus, that's repulsive, bad, that's a plus sign in potential. So when these cancel out, it's going to be very noisy based on the exact positions of all these atoms. And at the end of the day, that's going to tell us whether it's a good or bad confirmation. Remember, good low energy, bad high energy. But if we imagine exactly the same molecules, but forget about those charges. So we just look at the repulsion and dispersion part of this. Again, if we push these atoms very close together, they are not going to want to overlap. Uh, that's exactly the same between all atoms. And if you push them close enough, imagine a nuclear device or something, eventually that repulsion is going to be even stronger than the electrostatics, even if they have different charge signs. But at very long distance, well, I already said that is weak. So come on, why can't we just start ignoring that? If you look at that one atom and look at 5,000 neighbors, what's the sign of the interaction with that atom? It's attractive. That one is also attractive. That one is attractive. That was not attractive, and that one's attractive. So the attraction or dispersion at long distance has the peculiar effect that all the signs are negative. They all attract each other. So eventually if I just, well, when I add up enough of these, the energy will always be negative. And that's why you get these effects that if you just reduce the temperature far enough so that you overcome the thermal energy, 
we're going to come back to that later on in the class, eventually that small sign will start to dominate and that's why even noble gas is condensed at some point. So we can't ignore this. It's much weaker than the electrostatics, but where the electrostatics fluctuate with different signs, the attraction will always have the same sign. And that's why we need to consider both of them. So armed with the knowledge now about the typical interactions we have in atoms and having a little bit of grasp about how atoms move, we're now going to revisit the hydrogen bond. It's not going to be the last time we revisit the hydrogen bond. Remember that simple atom? Oxygen and hydrogen, water, the miracle of life. Well, let's be proper. Instead of doing those nasty partial charges, let's assume we had an infinite amount of computing power and that we were to calculate the exact electron density around this. Uh, if we were to do that, you're going to need to trust me that we would have higher electron density around the oxygen, red here, and low electron density around the hydrogens. This could only be described with a three-dimensional density function describing where it's high probability of finding electrons and whether it's low probability of finding them, and then we would have to visualize that in some part. But since I need something simple, what I'm going to take any, the electron density that is closer to the oxygen, I will just assume that that is placed on the oxygen, and that's when we can do these things that we pretend that we have minus, say, 0 0.82 is one common water model, oh, sorry, and then plus 0 0.41, I almost hit that, uh, minus 0 0.82. Uh, that's what I call a partial charge. It's really a pure invention. I typically need the quantum chemistry to calculate this, and, but this is now a much simpler model where I can apply ball and stick and just use traditional Coulomb interactions. For something as simple as water, I could in theory parameterize this based on an experimental results, and that's typically how we do it for water models. But if you have something that's part of a drug molecule or something, the only way to do this is put this into a computer and run a quantum chemistry program to try to find what is roughly the partial charges for this particular molecule in isolation. Again, this is an approximation. There is no question about it. But by doing this approximation, we're going to be able to handle all these other aspects that I just took you through. We're going to be able to handle flexibility in this molecule. Every torsion here can move. We're going to be able to handle what happens when it's interacting with other molecules and what happens if we put it in water. So that we pay some, but we gain tons of other things. And that's roughly where we're increasingly going to be heading. We're not going to spend the majority of this class doing computer simulations, but this type of sequential modeling is really going to help us understand what happens inside molecules. So we already introduced hydrogen bonds a little bit. Um, if you just let me erase things here, we can start to think what's happening inside a protein. All these different interactions we would have in a protein, uh, both the electrostatics and van der Waals, we have some very strong interactions. We have bonds, angles, uh, we have some intermediate definition strength lines, torsions, and then we had some very weak ones such as these van der Waals interactions. The only way to properly handle these weak non-bonded interactions, then I would need to describe this as this 1 over R6 attraction at very long distances, dipole-dipole interactions, and then an exponential repulsion at very short distances. This is a potential form called the Buckingham potential, and this one I would actually work pretty darn well, and it is used sometimes in computer simulations. The only problem here is that calculating the exponential function can take hundreds of clock cycles on a computer. Today you can probably do it fast on a graphics card, but these models were originally developed in the 60s and 70s, and then they most definitely didn't have GPUs. Is the form there important? Well, yes, Virginia. That form is super important if you're going to be employed at a national lab and designing nuclear bombs. But in a biophysics lab? Well, I haven't checked lately, but it's very rare that we have nuclear devices going off in our physics lab, biophysics lab, that is. So I do not really want to, I don't worry what's happening if two atoms are literally overlapping each other. I just want something very simple. And I want something that goes up quickly as I approaching unity. So if I have this one function here that is literally the dispersion, that is 1 over r to the power of 6, I would now like something that, and that has a minus sign. Again, it's attractive, it's good. I would now like some sort of other function with a plus sign, but that increases even quicker. 
But if I now take this 1 over r6, and that is stored in a variable, if I just square that, then I get 1 over r12. And you can do the math here, so that the 1 over r12 component here, that will increase even faster than 1 over r6. That is just one multiplication, which literally takes one clock cycle on any computer today. And now I have a plus sign on that one. So what that's going to get me is I, I now have this sim a simplified interaction form where at very short distances this term is going to dominate. It's not the exact potential I have down there. And at very large distances this term is going to dominate. And that is in practice what we all use in computer simulations. How good is this approximation? Well, it's not just good, it's very, very good. It's not quite as good as Buckingham, uh, but I have to confess that the Buckingham approach too isn't exact either. Remember when I showed you that atom being surrounded by all other atoms? This is really a collective effect, particularly the induced dipole uh, measures. So that you would actually not just have to calculate pairwise interactions, but triple interaction, quadruplet interactions, pentuplet interactions, etc. And that's simply completely unrealistic. So no matter what functional form we have here, if we try to parameterize that from quantum chemistry, it's not going to work well. But if I have any way accepted that I'm going to have a simplified form, I can now take these parameters and just put one factor on the repulsion and one on dispersion. And then I try to parameterize this to fit, for instance, the density and heat of vaporization of small molecules. And that means I now get parameters that they're not strictly exact in terms of quantum chemistry, but they're very good at describing how atoms either attract each other at long distances or repel each other, at least at intermediately short distances. At some point, it will start deviating from the exponential, but then we're no longer doing biophysics. I don't really care. This functional form is called the Lennard jones interactions. It's actually not a pair of scientists. It was called John Lennard jones and you will likely see that. Uh, occasionally we call these van der Waals interactions, or we abbreviate VDW. Uh, personally, I would say that van der Waals interactions are all the types of non-bonded interactions, including the Buckingham one I just showed you. But again, there is a bit of nomenclature mismatch there. The important thing is that you know what you're talking about. These are extremely weak. Um, you might, we might be talking about 0.1 kcal per mole. Remember that, that electrostatics, uh, and well, bonds in particular, but even electrostatics that tend to be around the same atoms. An electrostatic interaction between two atoms that have unit charge and are separated by a few angstrom might be a few hundred kcals, so thousands of times stronger than electrostatics. The reason why this was still important was this effect that these all have the same sign while the electrostatics will cancel each other under many conditions. So let's look at what the functional form looks like. Um, basically, if I, I'm going to sum the interactions in all a molecule, I would have a double sum over all the pairs of atoms, and I would have one term that corresponds to the repulsion, and one term that corresponds to the dispersion. And once we've done that, we can actually translate these parameters and see what types of energies we're talking about in normal molecules. You don't need to know that by heart. Uh, but if one starts doing molecular modeling, it can be kind of fun too, because knowing the, roughly knowing these numbers give you a gut feeling for how strongly atoms are interacting. So in principle, now we have everything to start to calculate energies, admittedly in a simplified way, but understanding how atoms are interacting in fairly large molecules where bonds can rotate and move. Let's have a look at that if we bring everything together. So if we are to bring all these interactions together. This is another beautiful illustration that I got courtesy of Mike Levitt many years ago. Um, don't worry too much about the exact shapes in here because again, different programs, different scientists tend to use slightly different standards for this. But if I want to describe something in a molecule and describe the complete potential, there will have to be one term that corresponds to all these harmonic bond vibrations there will have to be one term that corresponds to all the harmonic angle vibrations, and those are visualized up there. Then we're going to need one term describing all these torsion potentials, and that's the one in the middle here. I can't stress enough how important torsions are, and the reason why torsions are important is that they're intermediate. You won't know that yet, but it's going to turn out that Energy variations that are very small, that's kind of like gravel in the road. We run over them, it vibrates a bit, but it's not really going to change where we get. 
and energy barriers that are very high. They're going to be like brick walls. You're not going to get through them. So the interesting aspect are the middle, the average energy barriers, and that's exactly the torsions. And again, they're illustrated by these rotations around the central bond. Then you have these Lennard Jones interactions. Uh, again, this is formulated in a slightly different way, where we have a unit of energy and then an equilibrium length there of the bond. It's a small mathematical exercise to show that this corresponds to those C6 and C12 numbers I had on the last slide. And that would correspond to this repulsion and dispersion part. And finally, we have an electrostatic energy where this has to do with units, whether you're 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 or whether you're using CGS units. So forget about the 332 factor there. Those are the electrostatics, hundreds of kcals. This might be 0 0.1 kcal, torsions a few kcals, and these are hundreds of kcals too, and we're never going to be able to break them. So in principle, that's everything you need to do to describe what the energy is in one conformation of a macromolecule. But here's the thing. The interesting part is we want to compare different conformations, what happens when they move. And now things are going to start to be quite different when quantum chemistry, because this is much more difficult for quantum chemistry to do than for us. So imagine that we take all these things together and sum them up. Um, we're going to come back later to how you let a computer do this. But if I have a potential, if you studied your undergraduate physics, you know that the negative derivative of the potential, that's going to correspond to the force on a system. Again, the potential of lifting a weight is the mass times the gravitation factor times the height, and the force down is the derivative with respect to the height, minus the derivative. If we know the force on molecules, we use Newton's first law. If I know the force, I can calculate the acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. And the acceleration describes how the velocity is changing. So if I started from some velocities, for instance zero, I can then calculate how the velocities would be a very little while later. Then I know what the velocity is, and the velocity is how the position is changing as a function of time. So that means that I can calculate how the positions are varying. So this enables me to take small steps and really simulate in a computer how a molecule would move as a function of time. The problem is that small is something that should be taken literally here. You're going to need to do this in orders of femtoseconds. So this is just one motor molecule from the simulation I previously showed you a couple of times moving, and I've hidden all his neighbors in this case. But the advantage is that computers can do tenth of thousands of these steps per second today, and we have very large supercomputers that can treat molecules with millions of atoms. So this has suddenly become a very useful biochemical tool, whereas 20, 30 years ago it was something that only theoretical physicists used for very simple systems. What can we do with that? Well, let's see if we can revisit some things, such as how large molecules move, or first maybe the hydrogen bond. Last lecture, I spoke a little bit about hydrogen bonds in terms of partial charges. You have the oxygen, where you have the negative partial charge because it has stolen some electrons from the hydrogens. We talked about orbitals before, and the reason why this happens, we can describe this with orbitals too. All of this is due to the electron density around the atoms. But if I were to draw this with orbitals, uh, what has actually happened is that the orbitals around the oxygen here, they're in tetrahedral shape so that you kind of have one electron cloud pointing up here, another one pointing up there as ears, and then there are two of them as legs. What has then happened in a normal water molecule, that in, for two of these orbitals, those electrons have paired up with the hydrogens, uh, and that's why we have these larger rabbit ears here. So for two of those electron pairs, they are literally formed pairs, and they're formed stable bonds. Now, a water is not reactive, so we don't have unpaired electrons here, um, but these pairs are so-called lone pairs. They're complete orbitals, so it's not going to be super reactive that it's going to start binding to other things, but you have a negative partial charge here due to this orbital and another negative partial charge due to this orbital. Um, so that means that the entire oxygen here is going to be more negative, while the hydrogens up here are more positive. And as I mentioned last lecture, this is a very strong effect. If we then take two of these atoms and bring them close together, you're going to get this effect that this water down here is going to have a hydrogen here that is slightly positive, and that's going to love to interact 
Last time I said that it was interacting with the oxygen, but it's not really interacting with the oxygen. It's interacting with those lone electron pairs. We're going to need some sort of nomenclature to describe this because we're basically this is a very generous water. This water is basically taking his proton, the hydrogen there, and letting the other water molecule borrow his proton a bit to team up and become a partner to his very lonely electrons there. So we call this a donor, um, a hydrogen bond donor, and this would be a hydrogen bond acceptor. And that is the hydrogen bond. Um, there's a UPAC standard that we're supposed to draw hydrogen bonds with three dots. Uh, sorry, UPAC, if you're listening. Um, I, this is a very old illustration that I borrowed. This is a strong interaction. It's not as strong as a typical bond. It's not as strong as a typical full-blown electrostatic interaction. Because remember, we have a net zero charge here. We have a net zero charge here. Um, I'm going to need to tell you what the inter it would be a bit absurd to introduce hydrogen bonds without telling you roughly how strong this is. In the case of water, you're talking about a few kcals, uh, maybe five kcals, around 20 kilojoules per mole. Do you see that I made this mistake that I told you about a few seconds? I just said five kcals. Bad, Eric. Uh, five kcals per mole. But you're used by physicists now, so when I said five kcals, hopefully you assumed that it was five kcals per mole. So how do you determine which one is a donor and acceptor? Well, this gets a little bit more complicated because what if you take that water atom? Assuming that I, there might be a third water molecule here with two hydrogens. This one is also interacting. So this hydrogen would now form a hydrogen bond to that oxygen. But in this case, this is the acceptor and that is the donor. So the acceptor and donor is not specific to the molecule. Uh, in fact, as you're going to see later, it's very common to have hydrogen bonds inside a single large molecule, such as a protein. The donor and acceptor criterion is around the specific hydrogen bond. So in this hydrogen bond, that oxygen is the donor. Notice that it's the oxygen that's the donor, not the hydrogen. The oxygen donates its hydrogen or proton to this other acceptor that has the lone pair electrons. But this, in the sense of this particular water molecule that's also participating in this hydrogen bond, in this hydrogen bond, the same oxygen here acts as a donor and donates this proton to this oxygen as an acceptor. So you need to understand the hydrogen bonds, you need to understand the donor and acceptor, and you need to, I should be able to wake you up at 3 a.m. in the morning and you need to know what the energy of a hydrogen bond is. Uh, Seriously, it's one of the most common questions I ask people in the exam, and I'm simply flabbergasted that people haven't learned that by heart. Uh, do yourself a favor, look that up and train on that every day. There is a reason why it's so important, and there is a reason why it's important enough that you need to know it by heart. So as we've defined the hydrogen bonds and the no donor and acceptance nomenclature, we can look a little bit at hydrogen bonds in real molecules. I already mentioned water, right? And in that movie that I showed you, I mentioned that water, a perfect ice crystal at zero Kelvin, would have exactly two full hydrogen bonds per water. That is not as simple as you might think, because each hydrogen is participating in one hydrogen bond. But the oxygen also has two electron pairs, so each water molecule is participating in four hydrogen bonds. But it's donor for two of them and it's acceptor for two of them. So it's kind of, it's participating forming four half hydrogen bonds. So the total number of hydrogen bonds is going to be two per water under the ideal scenario. Now, once we start cranking up the temperature and going to, uh, say, room temperature, so when we have liquid water, what's going to happen is that the number of hydrogen bonds is going to go just so slightly above two, but as long as we're iced, it's not going to uh, increase a whole lot. And then when we move over to the liquid phase, there will be a jump because the atoms will now, the molecules will now start to diffuse and move relative to each other. But it turns out that almost all the hydrogen bonds are still intact. Liquid water has an average of 1.7 hydrogen bonds. So if you do H2O aqueous phase is 1.7 H bonds. And if instead you do, I'll say X-ray for a crystal, 
that would be roughly two eighth bonds, not quite. If I were to boil the water then, if I would course go all the way to gas phase, I would have zero hydrogen bonds. That's not quite true, but there will be some of them formed transiently, but in principle in gas phase things are so far away from each other that they do not interact. We already talked about DNA. Remember that I mentioned that inside the DNA, the reason DNA paired up the way they did was because we had this basis. Uh, purines and pyrimidines, A, G, C, and T. And these form specific hydrogen bond patterns from a purine to a pyrimidine and either two hydrogen bonds or three hydrogen bonds uh, under the normal Watson-Crick base pairing. That's what gives DNA its specificity. If, it was, if the hydrogen bond was very weak and easier to break, the DNA would not maintain its structural integrity. And there are a ton of hydrogen bonds in this DNA spiral, and that's of course why it's stable and it doesn't deteriorate, which we should be fairly happy about, because if it deteriorated quickly, we would form tumors and have errors in our genetic code. But it's not just DNA. Uh, it's going to turn out that almost all the molecules we work with in this class have hydrogen bonds. We're going to talk about protein structure. Um, on the very far there you have a so-called alpha helix. And in the alpha helix we have tons of hydrogen bonds formed along a staircase. It's going to involve those peptide bonds I showed you before. The other panel there shows so-called beta sheets. We'll introduce them next week. And the beta sheets also have a ton of hydrogen bonds. So there are two aspects that we can learn already from this lecture. Remember how I said how the torsions are important because the torsions determine the rotational degrees of freedom. That is, they determine how a molecule can move. On the other hand, the strongest interactions that actually form or break are the hydrogen bonds. Note that form or break is an important modifier there because if I literally tore bonds apart, those interactions would be much stronger. But those interactions are so stronger that they are brick walls, and I won't push my head through a brick wall. Sorry, not even for a lecture. Uh, but the hydrogen bonds are so strong that they're important to form interactions, but they are weak enough that you can actually break them under some conditions. For instance, if I'm changing temperature or conditions. And that's why this is going to be such a miracle that we're going to look at when do hydrogen bonds form, can that explain when things are stable or not, and the part that allows the molecule to reach those different states will be the torsional degrees of freedom. So again, you need to know what are the important degrees of freedom in most biomolecules and what are the most important interactions to stabilize degrees of freedoms, hydrogen bonds. So now we're almost done, right? Now we just need to wrap things up and understand how hydrogen bonds describe protein structure and then we can finish this entire class after two lectures. I'll deliberately run a little bit ahead of ourselves and imagine if we have a protein and we talked about proteins having these long sequences of amino acids that I described in the first lecture. There is some sort of sequence, for now I'm going to forget about what it is. Um, this green part is the backbone and that's, as I already drawn in a couple of cases, that is this nitrogen C alpha carbon. Nitrogen C alpha C, nitrogen C alpha C. That's the backbone or main chain of the protein structure. And then connected to each alpha carbon, C alpha, we have a side chain, which I called R. Those side chains, as we will see later, are going to have slightly different properties. Uh, but some of them are going to like water, so-called hydrophilic ones. Other ones are not going to like water, hydrophobic or fearing water. What I've drawn here is a highly schematic part where the yellow part here corresponds to some sort of side chains that would be hydrophobic. And I've deliberately, I think it might even be Finkelstein's illustration, that we've deliberately drawn some water right next to this. Now, waters are not going to like to be right next to something that's hydrophobic. Why? We will have to wait until next lecture or two to show. Uh, but you can probably guess that already on the previous small snippets here, right? Those water molecules, they want to participate in the hydrogen bonds. And if you now have something that's a pure carbon here, there are no lone pairs, there are no hydrogens that molecule is not going to be able to participate in a hydrogen bond. So the waters here right next to the hydrophobic molecules will not be able to participate in hydrogen bonds. So why, what might happen if we now take this protein and throw it inside a cell? In a split second, what if this protein somehow curls up? 
so it can take these yellow parts and put them together so that the hydrophobic or oil-like parts will now be next to each other. We already know that's what happens if you throw oil in water, right? And then all the waters will somehow be out here free to interact with each other. In principle, that's not entirely wrong. That's partly how things actually do work. Um, and there are a couple of things here that we're going to need to understand. And that's why there will be a few more lectures before we can do this for real. Uh, first, we're going to need to understand what are the different amino acids we have involved in a typical protein. And why do they have different properties and what are those properties? And that's going to come up in two lectures, I think. We're also going to need to understand what is this concept of state. I talk here about some sort of unfolded state and some sort of folded state. So first, what is a state? Is that specific x, y, z coordinates or something? Or is it some sort of larger things? Well, to be honest, we haven't even defined what a state is. This is just random drawings. Um, we're going to need to understand a little bit what actually happens with these waters and hydrogen bonds under different conditions. When will waters form hydrogen bonds and will, will they break hydrogen bonds? I've already hinted to you, actually even explained twice, that the reason why water has its properties, and in particular such a high boiling point, is that those, hydrogen, those water molecules will do almost anything it takes to maintain their hydrogen bonds. So it's not going to be as easy as breaking hydrogen bonds and then you can go to another state. So we're going to need to understand the torsional degrees of freedom, how these chains will rotate. We're going to need to understand what that means that it happens when this moves over to another state. Do we get more or less hydrogen bonds? And then things might get really complicated because you might have a water here that forms a hydrogen bond with the protein. But in this case, the same water might be forming a hydrogen bond with another water molecule. So all we've done in some cases will be that we have just moved around the hydrogen bond. So we still have the same number of hydrogen bonds, but they are suddenly formed with different molecules. And that is also something that we're going to need to start covering with physics. And it turns out that a unifying concept here that's going to come back, this has to do with arrangements. Different ways of arranging molecules and then trying to decide is this arrangement good or bad. And this far I've just glossed over that. I've just told you and you just believed me when I said a negative energy is good, a positive one is bad. We're going to need to derive that a bit. Uh, and you might, you've probably seen this in physics, I don't think you've derived it, which is quite fun because it's some of the most basic concepts in physics. If we're going to do this proper, I would be throwing a ton of equations at you. Caveat, I am going to throw a ton of equations at you. But if I do that tomorrow, I would only have one-fifth of the class remaining for lecture four, which would be a bit of a bummer um, because I kind of like these things and I won't introduce you to it. So we're going to follow Finkelstein here and I'm first going to introduce this with a bit of hand-waving in the third lecture without going to too much gory details about physics. And then later on, when we've had a chance to go back to biology, we're going to show this in a more universal way where we don't make as many assumptions. But this will arm you with the arms you need to understand models in very generic systems. We're going to be able to start drawing conclusions about what processes happen, when will, for instance, a protein fold, when will it not fold. You will be able to explain the hydrophobic effects. You will be able to explain what happens in phase transitions and a bunch of things that are borderline pure statistical physics. But they are super important and I would argue that long term it's probably the things in my education that I've had most use of. Um, the most complicated equations are not necessarily going to be the ones that look most difficult. The hardest equations are frequently the easiest ones. But that is probably all we're going to say about the different confirmations today. There's one final concept I want to leave you with. Assuming that for each of these confirmations, I can calculate what the energy is. Um, whether that involves hydrogen bonds and everything, I might have a gigantic computer. We could do this for the alanine dipeptide, right? Remember, just two degrees of freedom. I changed the phi and the psi torsions, the so-called Ramachandran torsions, and then I plot it in a Ramachandran diagram, and I get the energy as a function of those two torsions. In practice, when it's the alanine dipeptide is such a common molecule, we all know what these angles are, so we tend to draw that in two dimensions. But of course, we could draw this in three dimensions. This is also another study on the alanine dipeptide. And here too, red is bad, blue is good. It contains pretty much the same information apart from the fact that it's a slightly different study.
But most of the molecules I've showed you contain way more than two degrees of freedom. Many of the computer simulations we do contain a few millions of degrees of freedom. And I'm not sure about you, but I find it somewhat difficult to imagine one million dimensional spaces. So we're going to need to simplify this some way. And what we typically do is that we think of some sort of rugged landscape and we say that it's high dimensional, but it's not really high dimensional. This is still just a two dimensional landscape. It's just that I have lots of minima and maxima here. And the reason for those lots of minima and maxima, again, if I imagine my one million atoms, there are going to be lots of places where they are very happy and interact closely, all the blue parts here. And there are likely going to be lots of places where they bump into each other and are not so happy. And that would be the green parts of this particular energy landscape. And somehow the only thing I have to decide to determine where a protein is, is what is the best point in this energy landscape? I think. Or is it that simple? Because now we also, if there was one molecule, you could imagine that it's that simple. But assuming that this is water, and we might have Avogadro's number water molecules in a glass, every single water molecule can't be at the same time at once. So in particular, it might very well be that a particular bond is really good to form. Uh, but if we would take a very large molecule and stick that so it can't move at all, it has to be in the very lowest position here. That might be bad for other reasons. And for now, that will just have to be hand waving. This corresponds closely to a concept that you have touched before entropy. Uh, you think entropy is going to be difficult. If there's one thing I promise you, is that after this class, you will hopefully not think that entropy is difficult. But we're going to need to find tools that describe what do we mean about the distribution in this energy landscape? What do we mean by moving in the energy landscape? In principle, it's bad to be at the peaks here, but sometimes you might have to move across a peak to get from a low but not really lowest well and to find the really lowest well here in the middle. And right now I can't say when will that happen, when will it not happen. I just hand waved and claimed to you that, well, when we have intermediate energies, that's good enough. But intermediate energy has to be intermediate relative to something else. So there has to be an energy scale that we're not aware of yet. That covers what we're going to talk about for molecular interactions today. Um, as always, I have prepared a number of study questions for you. I will not cover those in detail. I won't read them for you, but read them here. They're also present on the Canvas site. For those of you at KTH, we organize a seminar when we sit and discuss this before next lecture. And uh, some of this might be easier than others. There might be a few ones that I haven't covered in detail here. Uh, we talk about enantiomeres in a protein. Uh, if there is something that you feel is not complete, not at all related to what I'm talking about, don't worry. Skip that one. It was from a time when I had more information about amino acids in this particular lecture. But I will come back to the amino acids next week instead. But most of these you should be able to answer with the current knowledge you have. If you haven't yet done so, start reading chapters three and four in Finkelstein. Uh, Finkelstein doesn't go into a whole lot of detail about amino acids either, and that's why I've changed this up a little bit. There are two very cool papers that I think it could be worth reading on uh, Canvas. First one is David Eisenberg that talks a little bit about the way we discovered proteins and secondary structures. Again, that's a bit of wetting the appetite before next lectures. And I've also, I was able to find the Cyrus Leventhal article in Scientific American from the 1960s when they described this molecular model building by computer. It's quite fun. Those were in the days where the Scientific American published truly groundbreaking scientific papers, not, not necessarily the type of popular science we think about today. Not that that's bad. With that, I'll thank you and see you next lecture.